So, um, welcome to the third of our seminars in this, in this series. Um, one thing I've been struck with over the, over the weeks now is how there's been a really strong emphasis on, I don't know, crossing and connecting disciplines. So we've had classicists and ancient historians looking at, as it were, um, and people from other disciplines, um, so bioarchaeology and then um, <coughs> creative writing, um, and sort of looking, looking in. Right, that's a, that, 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 that binary is, is, over, is over simple, but you know, we're bringing together, we're connecting, we're crossing disciplines. Um, and we're going to continue to do that today with someone who is a plasticist, who started off um, doing the big BA in history at Lisbon, and then did a master's in Lisbon. My dream, and it looked like it might happen at one point, was for her to come to Roehampton several years ago and work with me and Fiona on an aspect of all oh, domestic violence, um, for all sorts of reasons linked with the nature of the funding scheme. It didn't happen. Um, so, Jana, uh, this is Jana, Jana, Jana. Costa, yeah. with lots of names, but you know, you're not a to me. Um, uh, then spent a few years working in, in finance, um, and then um, started, uh, what, two years ago? Um, a funded PhD with the FCT, and I'm sure it sounds good, they're amazing. It's very, very prestigious um, to work on domestic violence in ancient Greek literature and culture. Um, with a focus on how we can use modern approaches, modern comparative material, modern, modern um, um, theories, etc., in order to frame an interpretation of that evidence. So the thing with various things we've already heard is absolutely excellent. Um, so uh, over to you. Okay, when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, of course. Uh, thank you for showing up. I promise I'll try not to bore you uh, too much. Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Professor Susan DC. Of course, I, I greatly uh, admire her, her work. Actually, for a funny thing, uh, the first time I heard Professor Susan talking was uh, 10 years ago, in, yes, 10 years ago at the University of Lisbon, where she gave a conference. Um, about Zeus. Why the Zeus? Uh, why the Zeus ray? And that was fascinating. So this was the master part that I mentioned you earlier. So thank you and thank you for having me. It was very kind. But enough. Uh, the, about talking, how I am a fan of Professor Susan and you all know. Now keep going. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the topic I've brought to you today is part of my ongoing uh, doctoral thesis, which I'm currently uh, working on under the guidance of Professor Don Simos Rodrigues at the University of Lisbon. My thesis is about domestic violence in mythology, and I want to explore how domestic violence, uh, ancient narratives, um, I want to explore what drives people to act this way. What patterns we can see in this behavior? What consequences come out of it all? Plus, I'm curious to see how these stories reflect a real life issues and behaviors in ancient Greek society. And to do all of this, I'm taking an interdisciplinary approach with insights from fields like psychology or sociology. According to the United Nations, domestic abuse, and I quote, also called domestic violence, can be then defined as a pattern of behavior in any relationship that is used to gain or maintain power and control. And the abuse can be obviously physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, can have threat, and this includes any behaviors that terrorize, manipulate, humiliate. But considering the complexities associated with the term domestic, as we all know, when referring to the ancient world, let's focus only on the term interfamilial violence. We cannot deny that aggression and human violence have marked the progress of our civilization. And of course, what represents the topic of interfamilial violence better than the famous family of hatred? Well, this topic today is about that exact family and the succession of violent events that have left an indelible mark on ancient culture, from theater to poetry, and of course, to cinema. The House of Atreus has shaped various forms of representation in our world, 
But why? What makes this family so special? Well, unfortunately, it has absolutely everything. It has sex, it has brutality, it has sexual assault, it has homicide and the relentless pursuit of power and dominance. Ah, oh, but wait, it has an animalistic act. These are just some of the characteristics that define this house. So, I intend to scrutinize these types of violent behaviors and to see if we have a pattern or no. How does violence perpetuate across generations in an invisible manner? What drives the continuation of such aggressive conduct? So I'm going to dissect this, the dynamics and record, record these patterns. Of course, first I'll mention the origin of this violence, tracing back to the lineage of Atreus, with particular attention to the manipulative action of Tantalus and Pelops, and what are the roots cause of the criminal behaviors we witness and the implications. Secondly, the tumultuous relationship between Atreus and Thyestes, fraught with betrayal and revenge, as exemplified by the tragic saga of two brothers locked in a cycle of retribution. In turn, the murder of Idamemnon, of course, and lastly, I'll get to the theme of inherent aggression, examining the complex psychosocial dynamics at play in the narratives of Orestes and Electra and their relation with the matricide. I learned that this approach does not reflect projection of modern ideas or concepts onto the classical words and ancient story, but rather a profile survey that is present in mythology based on impulses once. I agree with Susan D.C. and Fiona McCarty in their article about Euxorcid, published in 2013 in the journal Evolutionary Psychology, where they state, and I quote, the impulses that drive men in the ancient Greek sources are, therefore, analogous with evolutionary impulses that produce violent behavior, both cross-culturally and transhistorically. So, as we know, Greek mythology holds in the first case of what we consider to consider be violent relationships. It may almost seem scandalous to try to analyze the behavior of elements of mythical stories, but we cannot help thinking that the gods and the characters or mythological narratives are created in the image of man and by man, and that in their behavior are codified some pertinent examples of social action. And there is no other family that serves as the final example of interfamilial violence than the Atreus family. So I'm going to highlight uh, some moments. I'm not going to tell all the myths, of course, associated um, versions, but highlight some. So, a resume, uh, because we all know the people here, <laughs> the myths. So, uh, 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 small and not so small results. So, the curse of this famous family began long before Atreus. It began with his grandfather, Tantalus. So the myth of Tantalus is one of the more well-known myths from Greek mythology, serving as a perfect example about the consequences of hubris, insults, rage, outrage, and disrespect towards the gods. Tantalus was used of gods, and he wanted to know if they were really Onesians, so he invited the gods to his home on Mount Cephalus for a feast, and he made a stew. But this stew, oh, this stew, this stew was very special, as we all know it, because it was made of his son Pelops. He served his own son as a meal to the gods in the attempt to test their omniscience. So to try to understand if they really know everything. Zeus was horrified by Tantalus' actions, punished him severely, they vanished into Tartarus, the deepest part of the underworld, where he suffered the eternal torment with hunger and uh, eternal thirst. So from this crime, we have a product, the first curse. The gods reconstructed the body of Pelops and restored it to the life in place of the shoulder, which he had been eaten uh, by, by the matter, made him an ivory one. But then we have Pelops, who kills Hippodamia's father and Mariner. They had a lot of children, including, including Atreus and Thyestes. But of course, it has to be tragic, so Pelops uh, um, also fell in love with a nymph and had Christmas. Driven and encouraged by their mother, Ipodemio, who acted like a jealous hero, Atreus and Thyestes hunted down their half brother, Chrysippus, the legitimate son of Pelops, and killed the young man. So the family crime begins very early for the descendants of Zeus. 
Then we have the succession. I'm not going to, to, to talk a lot, a lot about this. And so we have Atreus, who captured Thais, the son, and of course, mutilated their bodies, one uh, portions in the cauldron, and then served their remains to Thais, this at the birth Atreus decided to stage the reconciliation, invited his brother, hosted by himself, and after had eaten, Atreus revealed the horrific truth by presenting the severed heads, hands, and feet on another planet. Overcome the revulsion, Thais is vomited and swore revenge. According to some versions, he lived there horrified and goes to meet his daughter. He had learned through an oracle that he could only revenge on his brother through a son born of incest with his daughter. Without Pelopia, no it, Thais had raped the daughter and Aegisthus had born. So, of course, there's also a story of Aegisthus who has been exposed, but we're not going to support any of this. So, while pregnant, with Aegisthus, Pelopia married Atreus. When Pelopia discovers that Aegisthus was her son with the father, she commits suicide with the swords. Then Aegisthus, pulling the blooded weapon from his mother's corpse, goes to Atreus and kills him. Aegisthus was going to be the lover of Clytemnestra. So the myth of Thyestes and Pelopia is a tragic, of course, and settling chapter in the mythology. For Pelopeia, of course, she married her uncle, she was raped by her father, and then she committed suicide. Regardless, Agamemnon eventually ascended to the throne of Mankina, while his brother became king of Sparta. So then we have Clytemnestra, that was the, the, the wife of Agamemnon, of course. This is a, a very brief, because we all know this, this part. So Clytemnestra, Clytemnestra was, was married with Agamemnon, then he came back from the Troy War, and she made a, a scheme to kill him, of course, and many were versions of this. And then the son, Orestes, revenged the, 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 the murder of the father, killing his mother with matricide. So I'm not going to enter in these details of the myths. Here's the part I want to show you. So, with this brief resume, what can we observe? And this is the part that I'm into. At least six acts of violence are identified, corresponding to different types of homicide, matricide, and filicide. Of course, homicide, we can have an homicide and a matricide, yes, but we can defer the things, okay? Because we can't put uh, the murder of Athenia, for example, in infanticide. So let's put it in homicide. And first, in this first generation, we have the act of homicide and cannibalism. But this attitude is described as power, as an attempt to outsmart the gods or Tantalus to show that he knows more than the gods. Agreed upon by, by mythographers, Chrysippus was the legitimate son of Pelops, arousing jealousy in Hippodamia, who encouraged her sons, manipulating them to kill their half brother. These two brothers, Atreus and Thyestes, joined forces, driven by their mother, who harbored jealousy over her husband's extermination of Even more revealing is that these two individuals became opponents of each other, leading to Aeneas crime. Atreus murdered his nephews and served them to Thyestes, the father of the children, and as revenge was the crime of sexual assault arises with Thyestes, who slept with his own daughter, Pelopia, with whom he had a son, Aegisthus, who was both the son and also the grandson of Thyestes. And we have present the act of incest, as they have a consanguineous relationship. Agamemnon, then we have Agamemnon, kills his daughter, Aphrogenia, in the sacrifice to Artemis, convinced that it was fundamental, that it was essential. And Clytemnestra, the woman of, of masculine behavior who kills other, as well as Cassandra, upon their return. But are we facing a mere case of revenge, the sacrifice of the daughter? Ten years have passed. Where was the governance power? A deviant and anomalous situation from what was an understanding society. Then we have the matricide, of course, the murder of Clytemnestra by Orestes. And finally, with the rest is the curse was broken. So we know from the outcome of the Orestes that Orestes was considered innocent. He broke the curse. 
But to what extent does blame exist? We exclude, of course, the political and legislative issues of the 6th century BC. That curse was broken after the murder of a woman. It's quite intriguing because for the Greeks, behaving emotionally or violently was often associated with being barbaric. And ancient Greeks should maintain control over their emotions, whether in public or private settings, of course. However, when we see those myths involving women, we encounter a common belief in society and in culture. The idea that a woman is, of course, more emotional than a man, as we see with Clytemnestra. This contrast raises questions about gender and societal expectations regarding emotional expression. As Robert Wright wrote, from an evolutionary point of view, the leading cause of violence is maleness. Really? What about these cases, all of this? Hippodemia, Clytemnestra, we can't find traces of violence and aggression in various narratives, some of which may result in death. And from an evolutionary standpoint, certain behaviors like aggression and violence are seen across species, including humans, while theories often highlight male aggression in competition for resources or members. They also recognize that females may resort to violence under specific circumstances as the case. The Freudian myth of Totem and Tab draws attention to the fact that children do not content themselves with murdering their parents, but they feed on him. The dead father is symbolically alive forever, and we see this where? In everyone. In Tantalus, in Atreus, in Agamemnon, and Orestes. In this case, we find this correspondence with these elements. It means that in Orestes, we have the combination of five generations of power. We have the great-great-father, great-grandfather, grandfather, father, and grandson. So, grandson. so in which power feeds the masculine elements of the Andrew's family? For example, theories of parasite have led to primary cause attributed to an abusive and pathological family structure. This pathological family structure somehow fits in with the, the, the one we, we nominate as Atreus' family. In this case, we observe how violence, more specifically physical violence, was used as a weapon and a means to achieve a concrete goal. This physical violence passed from generation to generation, invisibly culminating in its recipient having the necessary tools to carry out. Can we see the generations of this family as abused elements? So can the victim have become the aggressor? In several cases, the child is used by one parent as an instrument for the murder of the other, as we, as we saw, for example, in the case of Atreus and Thyestes. We all know that Greeks construct these gods and these characters in their image, as I referred previously. So what could this act of violence mean? What did the act of killing or even mistreating one's accessory represent to ancient Greek society? In this case, for example, matricide. The murder of parents is a topic that remains even known. It was probably part of the general principles, as Delphine Leon from the University of Coimbra mentions. However, we have the evidence of laws that protected the progenitors and where we can observe that parasites is the most despised crime and the charge of patricide is used as the strongest kind of insult, as Fiona McCarley mentions in her thesis, the ideology of revenge in ancient Greek culture, a study of ancient Athenian revenge. Indeed, power and violence are connected. Those who have violence are also applying power. But the contrary isn't obligatory. But in any case, there's always a basis of previous violence, the threat of violence that accompanies and any exercise of power there was a structure, there was a double guilt, and the reflection of two types of guilt, the individual one and the hereditary one. Psychologists Martin Daly and Martin Wilson argue that there is a, this universal difference in how men and women use physical violence. They note that violent acts are predominantly carried by young men. And what we see in this famous house, in five women's 
So, in five minutes, just one, five minutes, sir, has used physical vacuums. The rest were backstage or were victims. Low pill, for example, yes, episodes of persecution and violence are abundant in Greek myths. It should be noted that normally those who appear as persecutors or aggressors are usually associated with the male gender, and the victim, victims are mostly women. The intestines of feminine desires, for example, plays a prominent role. Normally, there is a male desire imposed by force. Of course, women, women can be aggressors and carry out criminal acts. But the idea that the fewer being in a patriarchal and phallic dominated society could have the capacity to attack a man becomes somewhat bizarre. Sure, Pythonester killed her husband, and the result, she was killed by her son. Sure, Pythonester raped her daughter, and the result, she committed suicide. So the idea of power being in the hands of a woman could be inconceivable, as we saw in Pythonester, because we cannot forget that in an ancient thought, a woman was seen as the complete man. Besides, besides, she even assassinated the head of the household, her husband. Women, women had their places, but it wasn't absolutely not at the head of the power. The power to take another wife would be in the hands of men. The whole tradition made the guilt upon women, not men. Even if a man does negative acts for some reason, in major cases, it is always because of a woman. Of course, as we see, women can be aggressors. But in our days, for example, Mostly women are targets of sexual violence, physical violence, and psychological violence. According to World Health Organization, across the globe, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence. One in three. I repeat, this is an horrific sense. Sexual violence acts not only as a physical weapon, but also as a psychological one, having been almost overlooked in ancient receptions where you almost see it transformed in a topic of seduction. You might be wondering, what? What does all of this have to do with studying the ancient world? Well, I completely agree with Nancy Rubinowitz, because understanding ancient Greek culture special through epics and tragedy can shed light on modern day issues. By recognizing these themes like violence, were central to be cultural and are part of our shared heritage, we can gain new perspectives on both ancient and contemporary society. In essence, studying ancient myths and stories allow us to see how human behavior and societal dynamics have evolved over time, while also highlighting the enduring relevance of these narratives. Ultimately, the course met its end through divine intervention and the fulfillment of ancient prophecies. Orestes stood trial on the ancient court and was absolved of this crime with a pain and held self typing the scales of justice, that the cycle of violence was finally broken and the tragic saga of the house of Atreus found a symbols of resolution and also the victim, so the victim became the aggressor. We as humans have the ability to reason and pass down knowledge to future generations. There are different reasons for crime. Common motive, motive include jealousy, revenge, fear, anger. These feelings may be conscious or unconscious. Given all this information, can we reach some final conclusions? Well, no. <laughs> of course not. But, but we can outline a few points. We are talking about five generations who suffer three curses, turning them into the cursed family of Atreus. These curses aroused due to the aggressions they committed, particularly a theme of a physical violence. All these five committed the greater acts, which indicates some kind of stability within the cursed family. Of course, it wasn't something passed down directly, but rather indirectly. There are sons and grandsons and great grandsons, but that teaching process has passed, and that individual guilt of the individual act join the collective of the family. So the motives, again, jealousy, revenge, fear, 
and anger. These feelings were conscious, again, or unconscious. Aggression may appear as a solution of problems. Aggression may be a mean to acquire resources that others have. Aggression may be a form of defense. Remember the family of hatred. So, the truth is, despite all the different reasons, the end product is always acquisition of power and control of people and control of events. Do we think that it's so different from today? The House of Atreus is one of the most famous families in all of Greek mythology. Its story is the prime example of how a blasphemy can lead to an inescapable and continuing curse, which nevertheless can be lifted in truth, explanation or retribution. Donald Kagan, that was a professor of ancient history, of course, at Yale University, mentions that studying ancient history provides this unique perspective on humanity. And yes, the Greeks were aware that can human beings were capable of the greatest triumphs and the most horrendous crimes. And indeed, in narratives which may belong to the mythological realm, have a certain je ne sais quoi, something that captivated humans with extraordinary, extraordinary, something that was incredible. Yes, it was incredible, but it was a misogynist and violent society for us. The bottom line is that whether we like it or not, the fact remains, as Mary B. refers, that all Asian cultures were brutal by our standards. Is this family really so different from aggressive and violent families from today? The essence is really different. So I believe that classics and ancient history can have a role in the approach of today's fights. And I would like to, to end this presentation with the following idea. The understanding for equality and the need for human rights passes through the understanding of our being, our history, and our actions as humanity, and what involves it, as well as the fact that we are able to draw attention to current problems. In this case, with the perception of Greek mythology, we point out this important theme and this fight that we must complete and pursue against human violence and more specifically interfamilial 